you know, teach your clients as much as you possibly can in the book and you'll get, you'll get your coaching clients. Who's your audience and what is that message that you want to convey and what kind of value can you add for them? Welcome. You're listening to the Apartment Investing Show. This is where you'll learn how to start or scale your apartment investing career. Your host, Adam Adams, believes in personal development, physically, financially, and mentally. Adam and his guests will show you how to create residual income by investing in apartment communities. Now, here's your host, Adam AAA Adams. Welcome back to the Creative Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Adam AAA Adams, and today we are joined again with Mr. Brian Murray. Brian Murray is a real estate investor and a best-selling author of crushing it in apartment invest apartments and commercial real estate. So we're going to today, we're going to see behind the curtain and see what he went through when he was writing that best selling book. He self published it. We're going to learn tons of things. We're going to talk about why did he even write it? We're going to talk about the process of writing it and the results that he's getting in his business. And we're even going to share with you how you can find this book, which is, if I can say it correctly this time, crushing it in apartments and commercial real estate by Mr. Brian Murray. He was on the show in episode 311. This one's a signed copy. So he was on the show in episode 311. So let's welcome back Mr. Brian Murray. Brian, let's say this first. Since you've been on the show, episode 311, they can go back to 311 and listen to your story, get a lot of nuggets around real estate investing. This one in particular is if they're planning on writing a book for their business to attract XYZ, I want you to help us out. But the first question is, how long did it take you to write your book? And, and the second follow-up question is, would you say that the length that it took you would be the same length that it would take the next person? Or can you help them even streamline it more? Sure. And thanks for having me again, Adam. I'm really excited to be here and, and be talking to you again. Yeah, you know, it, 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 took, me, it took me a long time to, to write my book. I'm personally a, a, a pretty slow writer. You know, and I think, I think it would be different for everyone. I, it took me over two years to write that book, but you know, it's, I, I'm, I'm happy with how it turned out, but I'm one of those people that, that has to write it and rewrite it and rewrite things and chop things out and move things around. And, and, uh, you know, I, writing is a, is something that I find very rewarding, but it's also very challenging for me. And I'm, I'm very envious of those people who can just sit down and, and crank out great content. Um, it's, it's a lot of work for me. But, uh, but I do enjoy it. And, and yeah, over two years for me. And I think that it really depends on the person. You know, I, I'm also somebody who, when I get in, in going with writing, I'll, I'll, I'll reach a point where I'm kind of stuck and I need to walk away from it. And so, you know, there were times where I had to set it aside for a few days, a week, maybe even a month and walk away, forget about it for a little bit, let my head process, you know, everything that was going on come back to it and then, you know, have, have that motivation again and have those ideas and just keep it flowing. So, you know, it, it, it took a long time, but it doesn't, doesn't have to be that long. Ho hopefully, you know, some of the, some of the people out there who want to want to do this could do it a little faster than I did. Okay. Well, what was your big, why, why did you write the book in the first place? You know, I, I had um, kind of gotten some recognition and for, for some of my accomplishments in, in real estate investing and, and had some media attention. And, and I started to get a lot of people coming to me asking for help. And I was so, you know, I believe so strongly that anybody who wants to build wealth through real estate can do it and, and that they could do what I did. And that it's really not that hard if you're willing to put the work in. But, you know, I, how do I communicate that to enough people? And for me, the best way I could come up with was, was writing. Um, there just wasn't enough hours in the day to sit down with everybody who wanted to talk to me or, or meet with them. So I just made this decision that I was going to take a big chunk of my time and carve it out and say, you know what, I'm going to take everything that I learned, like the, the good, the bad, uh, my mistakes. I want to share it with people because if they can learn from that, you know, they'll be further along than I was when I started. And, um, you know, so anytime I knew that if I could, if I could get my thoughts on paper in a, in a book form that anytime somebody reached out and said, Hey, you know, could you mentor me? Could you help me? And I didn't have the bandwidth to do that. I could say, Hey, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't do that. But I put all my thoughts and everything I learned in this book 
and everything that I know or anything you might hope to gain from me to be successful in your own investing, you could just go to the book and find it there. Okay. Awesome. I think that's a good reason why. Some people, there, I think there's all ultimately um, many, many ways, many reasons why people would write, write a book. Some, some of them have a coaching program. It sounds like you had the opposite of a coaching program and you were like, I don't have time for that. I just want to crush it in apartments. And so I'm going to write a book and just give it to the next person. So that way I don't need to focus on or to get distracted from the big picture, which is investing in apartments and commercial real estate. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And I, I think having a good why when you write a book is super important. You know, I think, I think if, if anybody's thinking about doing it, saying, I'm going to write a book because I want to make a lot of money, that's, that's probably not the, the best motivation to do it. And, and, and most likely you're going to end up disappointed. I wrote a book a long time ago on marketing and I even got a publisher behind it. And, um, yeah, I, I made next to nothing on that book. It was a, it was a complete failure. And thousands and thousands and of business books and real estate books are published every year. And very few of them end up selling very many copies. So it's super hard to make money through book royalties. But if you have another reason for doing it, then you know it can serve its purpose and, and, and be a good thing for you. Okay. Well, let's go into your process of writing the book. Now, I want to start with my, my, my first question would be just around the, uh, publishing it. And, and so where in the process were, did you decide who was going to publish this book? And where in the process did you give it to that person to publish it? And what did they have to do to get it all published and ready to go? Yeah. So when I published my first book, I, I was really fortunate. I, I had an idea that somebody referred me to a literary agent who bought into that and, and supported me and actually ended up getting me a, a, a modest deal with a publisher. And so I had been through that process before and I had a literary agent and, and went to him with this idea. He shopped it around to dozens of different publishers uh, trying to assess whether there'd be any interest in publishing the book. And basically everybody said no. So at a certain point, he came back to me and he was like, you know what, you really should, I believe in this, what you're trying to do, you really should just go ahead and self-publish it. You know, you don't have anything to lose and it's not that hard and I can, you know, refer you to freelancers who could help you and, and you could do a, a publisher quality book if you choose to. And so I made the decision to, to do that. And so um, at that point, I reached out to a developmental editor with, with the material that I had assembled to that point. And a developmental editor will look through and at a high level, they help you structure it. Uh, they won't help you write it. Um, there are people out there that if you want a ghostwriter who will actually write the book for you, but a developmental editor want, wants to make sure that it's gonna flow properly, that the ideas transition from one to the other. And they'll come back to you and say, hey, I think you should consider chopping out this section or adding some more content in here, explaining this idea. Maybe, maybe this section needs to go further up here and maybe you need to you know, adjust your chapters, maybe merge these two, maybe add a chapter in on this because you're, you're kind of like skipping from step two to step four. Um, and they give you that, that high level and kind of keep you on track and keep things organized. So I hired a developmental editor and then I, then she informed me that, Hey, you really need a copy editor. You really need somebody to do a, a professional cover design. You have somebody go through and proofread the whole thing and all, all these different, the, the interior of the, of the book should be designed like the graphics of it. And I got a little overwhelmed with that. So I, I went to her and I was like, you know, you know, all these freelancers and, and, you know, would you be willing to organize that for me? So she did. She went out and basically assembled a team of people who were freelance. They all work for major publishing houses. And in the end, it uh, cost me about $15,000 all in to get a, a book published, self-published, without a publisher that most people would never distinguish from a, from a, a publisher quality book. And, and that's what I wanted. I, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, I, I put two years of effort into this and it meant a lot to me. I didn't actually think anybody was going to buy it, but it still, it was important to me that it was a, of a, a high quality and something that I could be proud of. And so I decided to make that investment. And I actually, I went to my wife and I, I told her what I was going to spend. And, and uh, I said, 
you know, this is important to me. I want to get this, these messages out there. I spent a lot of time on this. I'm going to, I'm going to spend this money on it. But I said, I got to tell you right now, I, I don't expect to ever get that money back. I said, if, if this book were a, were a wild success, like beyond what I'm hoping for, I could maybe someday hope to break even, but it's important to me. And I'm, you know, I feel really good about doing this and it's something I want to do. And so she was, she was totally on board with that. Wow. Okay. So it cost you out of pocket around 15,000 yeah. and your hope was, you know, your, your expectation was you're going to lose 15,000. The hope was maybe over a few years, I might break even. Uh, so what actually ended up happening? So it was kind of crazy because the, the, the book sort of took off pretty quickly. I did a couple of podcast appearances just to share it. I, I put it out there on social media and um, it initially it kind of started uh, slow, but it was selling more, way more copies than I expected. But then about within the first month, by the end of the first month, it just started to take off. And so I was just floored. I mean, I earned back that $15,000 in maybe a little over a month. And then it just kept going from there and, and um, ended up spending, uh, it spent a lot of time on, as a bestseller on Amazon. It's won several awards and, you know, it's, it's just, it's gone so far beyond anything I, I ever would have dreamed of. You know, I feel really blessed and, and uh, it's been a really rewarding experience. Really, really cool. Um, anything else in the process that is notable, we should mention, including lessons learned for the person who's listening and saying, you know, I'd really like to write a book too. And wouldn't that be cool if I could get it to be a best-selling book as well on Amazon or wherever. So um, anything else in the process that you think we're missing and or some lessons learned? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think really thinking through what message you're trying to convey and who your audience is, is, is important. What tends to happen a lot in real estate books and business books in general is, is people, you know, they, they kind of, instead of either writing a memoir or, you know, a, a content oriented book, they, they sort of merge the two and cloud it and somebody might read it expecting to learn about real estate, but then three quarters of the book is actually personal stuff about the person's life. And those don't generally turn out particularly well. So I think, I think right up front, really thinking about who's your audience and what is that message that you want to convey and what kind of value can you add for them and speaking to that audience. Um, and, I, and I do mean speaking because I feel like you can, you, you can really write well if you write like you speak and, you're in, and if, you, if you can read what you're writing out loud and it, and it, and it doesn't sound goofy or ridiculous, then it, you know, you're, you're writing well because you want to speak to that audience. I did some things that were a little bit non-traditional. I tried to incorporate some humor. I definitely incorporated some entertaining stories, but only stuff that would, would support the messages and the lessons that I was trying to include. I would say the more authentic and genuine you can be and open, you know, show a little vulnerability. Don't, don't be afraid. If you're going to share stories, share some things, mistakes that you made. The feedback that I've gotten on my book are that people genuinely appreciate that I was very open with my mistakes as well as my successes. And they appreciate the stories that are in there because they're, they're entertaining and they sometimes uh, reading a business book can get kind of dry. And it's hard to make your way all the way through. The, the, the information in there might be valuable, and, but you can only read so many formulas and, and you know, read sort of theoretical discussion. And so if you can incorporate any real life stories in there, whether they're about yourself or other people that you meet or research, um, I think that you know, those are things that could be really helpful. And then the other thing I would say is break it into small pieces. It's very overwhelming for someone to say, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write a whole book. It's very intimidating. And so the most important thing is to just start writing and do it in small pieces. You can do short articles or content that you're generating for your social media. Um, you can keep a, a journal related to the work that you're doing with like, different ideas. And just, if you can just start writing, and creating content, you know, if, if you could write even two paragraphs every day, that's not a lot. Most people would say, yeah, I could write two paragraphs every day. How many paragraphs are you going to have in two years? You're going to have more than enough content to start to move it around and make a book. 
Um, and so, yeah, don't, don't let the, don't let it overwhelm you. So you hired a developmental editor and big part of their job was to make sure that the structure of the book worked, make sure that you weren't missing chapters, making sure to put chapters together that really were more connected and bridging chapters. Uh, when you said bridging chapters, I think that's something that uh, most people wouldn't think about. So what do you mean by bridging chapters together? Is there like some type of cliffhanger, like when I'm watching uh, HBO and at the end of a at the end of a show they show me something and i like i actually have to i i said i was going to go to bed at midnight but i'm going to watch one more episode because i need to know what's going on is yeah let me know what do you mean by bridging chapters so by bridging chapters what i mean is that you have a smooth flow from one idea to the next and so that actually becomes important throughout the book like within the chapter within the sections of the chapter and even paragraph to paragraph so on a, on a small level, like every, everything you write, um, there'll be a transition that will sort of introduce the next concept and then you go into the next concept. And so at the end of your chapter, you're saying you, you're kind of like leaving off at a point where it's just a logical progression to start the, ne the next chapter with. And so you'll have that, you know, like that's a, that's a lot of feedback a developmental editor will have. They'll say, okay, well, in, in, chapter three section, this section, and then you follow it up with this section, but there's no transition. It's just kind of choppy. You just are like, you just introduce this, bam, the new idea. You need to, you need to transition into an introduce that idea. And then you present the idea. Um, so that's just part of when, when you, you don't want, you don't want the reader to be like thinking about like, whoa, this didn't like, where'd this idea come from? Or you don't ever want their mind kind of fixating on the writing or the, you know, the choppiness or this doesn't flow. You just want them not thinking about that at all. You want them engrossed in the content and, and reading and, 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 and if it's smoothly done and you have those transitions and that'll work, work much better. Um, you don't have to have a cliffhanger. I, I, I have some of those. And actually when I originally, I had one long story in the final chapter of the book and I had about a half dozen people that I trusted that read a draft manuscript and every single one of them was like, that chapter, those stories are fantastic. You should expand it. And then one of the, one of the, one of them said, why don't you break it into sections and spread it throughout the book rather than hoping people get all the way to the end and then read it. And that, that was a brilliant idea that that person gave me. So I did go back, I expanded the stories and I made it flow and I chopped it into pieces and spread it throughout the book. And when I gave it to my developmental editor to, to read what I did, she came back and she was like, this is amazing. Like you don't expect a cliffhanger in a business book. Um, she was like that, this, this works really well. And uh, I think what that did is it did leave somebody kind of little curious and wanting to jump ahead and see, see what was going to happen next. So I, I'm really grateful for the, for the good feedback I got early on from, from uh, people who read that draft manuscript and, and made that change because um, readers have, have, commented a lot on, on how much they enjoy that aspect of it. Okay, good stuff. This episode was made possible by Adam's Inner Circle program. This exclusive group is a collection of industry leaders, influencers, passive investors, and strong operators. This is the type of community you want to join, where we come together multiple times each month, virtually and in person. We support each other, invest with each other, and even interview each other on our podcasts and invite each other to speak at our live events. If you're ready to take your real estate investing to the next level, this is the group for you. Fill out an application today by following the link in the show notes. And so the color and the design seem to be a, a, an important part of you having this book, like as if a book is judged by a cover. So if you could tell me just a little bit about what that means, why red, why black, why, why these fonts, why is crushing it so big, you know, like what of the parts of the color and design that you recall uh, learning from, why did, how did it turn out to be this way? So I had a, I had a professional cover designer and she came up with a whole bunch of um, like different ideas and, and really in the initial designs were not resonating with me. They were very traditional. Part of what I was encouraged to do while working with a cover designer is to go online and just look at as many covers as I could and communicate what aspects of different covers appealed to me. And, and that would 
allow the cover designer to try to incorporate some of that look and feel. And I felt like the covers that were bold uh, were better. If you had a cover that had too much like um, detail, like fine pictures and all these things, you kind of lost that, especially most people today are buying online over 95%, actually probably closer to 98% of my sales are online. So people are looking at a small icon you know, they're not looking at a full size cover. So you have to have, I, I felt like it was really important to have something that was bold and easy to read when it's, when it's a small icon on a, on a page online or on your phone. So from that, we got sort of the, the, the color scheme and it was actually my idea in order to make crushing it the largest to turn it sideways and fill the whole side of the book with it. And so I went back to the cover designer and was like, hey, you know, we can't get it big enough the way I want it. What if you turn it sideways and run it up the whole side of the page? And, um, you know, that worked well. I mean, it makes it recognizable. It's unique. I've seen only a handful of other ones that way. And, and, a, and a couple have come out recently that I think are, um, you know, recognizing that, hey, that's just a different way to use space that, that works well. and It's still easy to read. So I was pretty happy with that. It's unique. It's bold. And it kind of, um, it's, it's a good branding element of the book, I think. Good deal. I like that. Um, interesting. So you said before this book, you wrote a marketing and a branding book or, or marketing and a, tell me, tell me about the first book just so I can get a, a feel for what it was again. Sure. So this was a good, gosh, over 15 years ago. I was working for a tech company and uh, that, that, that tech company basically monitored brands online for uh, large companies. And so the book was called Defending the Brand. And, um, you know, it was, it was just a traditional hardcover uh, business book about uh, what, how brands are attacked online and what you can do to defend yourself. You know, it was, it was a subject that was of interest to certain people, but it, it didn't have broad appeal. You know, at, at that time, there really weren't in, in each company had maybe a, a different department that was starting to look at that type of thing. But, um, you know, there was no clear audience. And, you know, I think that's one of the, one of the reasons it was too niche. And, um, you know, basically when I got a publisher to agree to publish it, they paid me $5,000 and, uh, you know, then there was a royalty structure that if once I exceeded that, if I hit a certain number of sales, I would start to get additional royalties and then never reached enough to clear that. So, um, yeah, I got my $5,000, but if you were to back calculate how many hours I put in, I figured out that I, I made maybe less than half of minimum wage for all that time. And so, uh, that definitely didn't work out. And that was a part of like a reality check for me. And, and the reason why I knew there was a very good chance if I took the time to write a real estate book, it, it, it may not sell and, and particularly without a publisher behind it. But there's a lot of other purposes it can serve. You know, and you've mentioned some just that there's, you know, people do it for credibility. They can do it as almost like a, a business card, you know, but if you, if you're going to push something that you're selling in the book, readers, readers don't tend to like that. So you got to be careful not to make it too salesy if your entire book is trying to get you know coaching clients for example and that comes across heavily in the book that'll turn readers off so you're better off just making sure you're adding as much value as possible and you know teach your clients as much as you possibly can in the book and you'll get you'll get your coaching clients a lot of valuable information there i have three more questions um we're I'm going to wrap it up after these three questions. And so the first one is what are the results that you've gotten since you wrote the book? Yeah. So I don't have an exact count right now, but I'm somewhere around between 60 and 70,000 copies have sold. And you know what, one of the big surprises when I first published the book, I published a print copy and a, um, an ebook. And then I started to get people when it, when it took off, I, I I got people asking, well, where's the audiobook?" And I had never even occurred to me to do an audiobook. I was like, I don't, no one's going to buy it anyway. Why would, I, why would I take the time to do an audiobook and spend additional money on that? So the audiobook followed about three months after the print and the, and the ebook. And the audiobook has sold more copies than the print and the ebook combined. That's so valuable to share. And by the way, that's the, I own the book. I've, I've been showing people the book, but the way that I read it was I listened to it. I, I listened to your book on Audible. If I could go back, 
I would record it myself. Um, it just seemed too intimidating at the time. So I had, I, I hired somebody who was a professional to read it, but I think I would have gone into a studio and, and preferred to actually read it myself. But you know, the, the reader did a, a fantastic job. And I think people who are consuming real estate advice and information, they like to do it via audio and especially the younger generations. It's, it's a great way for them to be productive during commute times or when they're engaged in exercise or other activities. And so I feel like that's why podcasts are so valuable and, and, and well-received and audiobooks the same thing. So this wasn't a question that I planned on asking, but it's just a follow-up question on, on this Audible. You mentioned that you never had thought about doing it because it was just an extra expense to you and you didn't know how many people would listen to it. So my question would be when you hired somebody to read this book for you because it was intimidating, how much did it cost you all in all to get that up and running on Audible? Yeah, so um, I don't I don't remember the exact cost, but I think it was um, it was less than five thousand dollars. There's a platform out there. It's called ACX, and uh, that's owned by Amazon. And uh, basically, they took care of absolutely everything. In fact, what I did is I uploaded a section of a chapter and put it out there, and readers auditioned. So I could go through, and you know, they would tell me what how much they would charge. They would audition, and I went through, and I, I listened to dozens of different people who, um, you know, read that section of the book and, and I got to decide, Hey, who, who do I like the best? Who's, who's, uh, doing the best job with this. And, um, then I awarded it to the, the gentleman that I, that I ended up choosing and, and, you know, it, it, it turned out well, what, what's fascinating is they have two ways of compensation for, for that. One is it's a flat fee. And the other is you can take a percentage of the royalties. And I didn't want to pay a flat fee. I had already spent enough money and I was like, I don't, I don't, I still don't know if this is going to sell. So I tried to convince him to do uh, the royalty, the percentage of the royalties and he wouldn't do it. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I paid the flat fee and, 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 and that was a really, really good decision. <laughs> wow. That is so interesting. Thank you. All right. The last two questions. Number one is if you did it all over again, if you were going to write this book all over again, uh, it took you two, out, two years or a little over two years to get it written and published. Um, it cost you 15000 plus five more thousand to get it uh, edited published and um and on audible and kindle and everywhere else knowing what you know know now what would you do differently if you were gonna start this over today you know there's a few things i would do differently um i published both through um kindle subsidiaries or, uh, sorry amazon subsidiaries kindle and create space which have since been merged into kindle i also published through uh, ingram spark who has a broad distribution network. I'm not sure I would bother to publish through both of them. I'm not sure that was necessary. I had a lot of trial and error with pricing and I think that um, I would set a price and, and stick with it and, instead of making changes along the way. Maybe do a little more advertising than I did. There's a lot of, there's a lot of little things I, I would point to, but honestly, I'm, I'm so incredibly grateful for how things turned out that I'm, you know, if I could do it all over again, I would. In fact, I'm I've been working on an, another book for some time and, and uh, it's going super slow and I'm having trouble with it. What I've learned is it's a whole lot easier to write a book when you have zero expectations. <laughs> hmm. so Interesting. Read to work on it when you want. Um, you know, and so it's, I think talking to other authors, that's a, that's a challenge. A lot of people face if you, if you happen to have some success with a book, it, it, it seems like it becomes a, a mental hurdle. It's more challenging to kind of push that next one out there. And, um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to disappoint any of the readers of my first book. And so I, I do feel a lot of pressure that it, that it should be, you know, anything I put out there should be a, at a quality that they would expect. And, and that, that doesn't help make it easier to write. <laughs> So is it another real estate book then? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. Well, I look forward to, to that. Uh, is it going to take two years? Probably. Maybe. Okay. Two. Good, good. Well, I'll, I'll be ready uh, for that audible whenever it comes out. Mm -hmm. um, all right. The last question for you is how do people find this book? What's the best way for them to go and search for crushing it in apartments and commercial real estate? 
vast majority of my sales are on Amazon and that's definitely the easiest place to find it. Um, so, you know, I would encourage anybody that wants to, to read it, uh, go to Amazon or go to audible if you want to listen to it. And, um, I'm very grateful for anyone who decides to, you know, spend their money or their time, uh, listening or reading the book. Thank you for coming on. Uh, how do people find you? How do they get a hold of you, Brian? Uh, you can find me on, on uh, social media. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I have an Instagram account. It's uh, at Crushing It Brian. So any, any of those three platforms, you can, you can find me. Perfect. At Crushing It Brian, thank you for coming on the show again. Episode 311, and I'm not sure what episode this number is going to be. It's probably somewhere around the 370s, 380s. Um, really appreciate you coming back on the show again and just spilling the beans on everything you can to help us write our books as uh, we're getting to your level. I appreciate your time. I'm going to let you go, but until next time, my friend, think outside the box. As a reminder, any investment opportunities mentioned on this show are for accredited investors only. And if you're interested in working with me and my team, then go to realbluespruce.com and click get on the list. It's that simple. Just click get on the list to start passively investing. This has been an episode of the Apartment Investing Show with me, Adam Adams. All rights are reserved. And if you haven't done so already, then make sure that you absolutely smash that subscribe button and I'll see you on the next episode.